Now this is the televised moment of the Taliban takeover of the presidential palace in Afghanistan, marking the fall of the Afghan government after the withdrawal of US troops. Taliban relaunched offensive in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I have invited to our studios to discuss the, um, the, the return of the Taliban and implications for Sri Lanka. This topic, um, specialist in international security, Professor Rohan Gunaratna, who uh, appeared on my show last year after the Easter attacks, who spoke about his research and findings and more importantly, predictions of uh, the IS movement and, uh, and their expansion to our part of the region. Today, uh, I want to highlight a book he wrote, Afghanistan After the Western Drawdown. This book was written six years ago and um, the book titled Afghanistan After the Western Drawdown, where he accurately predicted the return of the Taliban to Afghanistan. Professor Gunaratna wrote, following the Western Drawdown in Afghanistan, the global and regional security landscape um, will change dramatically. Al-Qaeda, the Afghan Taliban, and their allies who are still posing a threat to the US-led coalition are poised to turn to Afghanistan. One month before the fallout of Afghanistan to the Taliban, Professor Gunaratna said to the international media, in fact to Wall Street Journal, on the 8th of July 2021, with the US troop withdrawal, the Taliban will become what they were before because the Taliban ideology has not significantly changed. Uh, Afghanistan will once again emerge as a terrorist Disneyland where all these foreign terrorist groups will build a formidable presence. Now the global and regional threat landscape will dramatically change, Professor Gunaratna, uh, with the return of the Taliban. Your prediction six years ago, how did this come about? What did you base your predictions on? We had assessed the evolution of terrorism by two threat groups. One is the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. And that had a huge impact that created a community even in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. where about 40 people traveled to Syria and Iraq. They joined that group and that ideology spread here and then we had a devastating terrorist attack. The East attack remains the worst terrorist attack by the Islamic State outside Iraq and Syria. Similarly, Afghanistan has once again emerged as an epicenter for the most dangerous terrorist alliance, mm -hmm. which is the Taliban. Taliban previously hosted Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda staged the 9-11 attack. Mm -hmm. So I want to say that if Afghanistan once again becomes an epicenter for terrorism and for transnational crime, then this region will have to constantly and continuously fight those threats emanating from Afghanistan, and it will also affect Sri Lanka. Uh, I'd like to speak more on the implications of Sri Lanka as we've promised uh, to discuss about it. But let me take our attention back to uh, 2001, 9-11 attacks, uh, the destruction of the Twin Towers. Uh, we can take a look at these visuals now uh, for a recap of that horrific incident. Now, Professor Gunaratna, these visuals as we look at it, the destruction of the Twin Towers uh, by the Al-Qaeda and attack on the Pentagon in 9-11, this is when we, our part of the world, started hearing and talking significantly of um, the Al-Qaeda and then the Taliban in 2011 when, when, when uh, Bin Laden was found in Pakistan. But before that, if you could uh, run through the significant and the series events of the formation of the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda and these groups that have posed a massive threat to world security. Afghanistan was a very beautiful country but on Christmas Day December 24th 1979 the Soviets invaded Afghanistan mm -hmm. they occupied Afghanistan 
and a multinational Afghan Mujahideen coalition was created in Pakistan with US, British, Saudi assistance. They overwhelmed the Soviets, the Soviets withdrew and just before the Soviets left, the Arabs who were fighting the Soviets created a group called Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was created August 11, 1988. Mm -hmm. Bin Laden was the leader. And this group said, we have defeated one superpower, that is the Soviets in Afghanistan. Mm. Now we are going to defeat the remaining superpower, that is the Americans. And they staged that devastating terrorist attack, killing nearly 3,000 people mm -hmm. by attacking the Twin Towers using aviation and a third plane attacking the Pentagon. So America's most iconic economic landmark, most iconic military landmark. And the, thir and the fourth plane was heading towards the Congress or the Capitol Hill because it was a very visible structure. Mm -hmm. They knew the difficulties of targeting White House. And of course, the passengers in that plane fought uh, against the hijackers and the plane crashed in Pennsylvania. What is significant is that iconic attack mm -hmm. on America's landmarks triggered so much of support among the Muslim exclusivist and extremist and terrorist groups. And these groups had been previously training in Afghanistan. Taliban was the host and that is why the United States intervened in Afghanistan to dismantle the Taliban because Taliban provided finance, training and other opportunities for this global terrorist alliance. Mm -hmm. Now the biggest fear among the international security and intelligence communities with the return of Taliban 20 years after mm -hmm. on August 15th, 2021, whether once again those terrorist entities will return to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Now there is a lot of talk about um, how bin Laden was found in Pakistan. First, the, the US launched, um, lo launched a search there in Afghanistan. You started off talking about what a beautiful country Afghanistan is, but what it is today is it's destroyed. It's in pieces. And um, in 2011, on the 2nd of May, Osama bin Laden was killed in Pakistan. With that, if you can also talk about the, the, the decisions made by the United States, first to launch a search in Afghanistan and then um, the, the, the bin Laden being found in Pakistan and how this also changed the face and, and, and the movement's nature. With the US intervention in Afghanistan on October 7, 2001, Osama bin Laden, Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, and many of the Al-Qaeda senior leadership moved out of Afghanistan. Some went to Iran and went to Iraq. Others went to Pakistan. In Pakistan, they occupied the tribal region and other parts of Pakistan. But the Pakistani government fought against Al-Qaeda, and about 400 Al-Qaeda operators were captured uh, or killed by the Pakistani government. Uh, but there was one target, one, the most precious target for the United States, that is Bin Laden. Mm -hmm. And the CIA was able to identify that Bin Laden was living in Abbottabad in Pakistan. And the CIA mounted an operation from Afghanistan using the American Special Operations Forces Admiral William McRaven mm -hmm. uh, launched that operation and Bin Laden was killed by the US uh, forces. And of course, after that, um, the Pakistanis were quite annoyed that uh, the Americans didn't get mm -hmm. permission from Pakistan to enter Pakistani territory. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you that operation demonstrates how states should respond to terrorism. If there are terrorists operating in third countries, it is important for governments to operate unilaterally if that target cannot be eliminated. So it's a very how, important... How, how, how do you, how do you say, uh, explain this to us? 
that is bin laden was operating in pakistan i personally believe mm -hmm. that the pakistani government did not know that bin laden was in pakistan uh, but the united states mounted the operation inside pakistan mm -hmm. to kill bin laden but the us did not inform pakistan ahead of time because they feared that had they shared this information with pakistan uh, that, Pax, that bin Laden may be moved out. Mm, mm. But I want to share with you that Pakistan did cooperate with the United States. Uh, about 400 Al-Qaeda leaders and operators, including the 9-11 mastermind, was captured by the Pakistanis uh, and handed over to the United States. So I think that Governments should always work with other governments in cooperation, collaboration, partnerships. But some governments are very suspicious whether other governments are actually harboring those terrorists. And then they will mount unilateral operations to kill their terrorists who are being harbored in other countries. Mm -hmm. But in the case of bin Laden, I can tell you based on my own research, that Pakistan did not know that bin Laden was in Abbottabad. If Pakistan knew, Pakistan would have certainly apprehended bin Laden and given him over to the Americans the same way Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the 9-11 operator, uh, was also apprehended by the inter-services intelligence of Pakistan, the Pakistan intelligence service and given to the Americans. Uh, you have had uh, interviews, spoken to key um, key leaders of the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, um, and, and these discussions have made you understand their movement, their ideology, and, their, uh, and, and the global threat posed then, now, and in the future. I go back to your book, Afghanistan After the Western Drawdown. You predicted six years ago. What are your predictions now? What do you have to tell us now with the, with the rise of the Taliban, with them taking over uh, authority? in uh, Afghanistan, um, there, there is a global, uh, there's global attention on, on the humanitarian needs in Afghanistan. But if you look at this movement and, and their power struggle and have, how they've returned, what implications does the world see now? Afghan Taliban captured power unconstitutionally. There was no election. And in fact, when I met the Taliban Foreign Minister, then Foreign Minister Mullah Mutawakil in Kabul, mm -hmm. I told him, I asked him a very simple question. I asked him, you destroyed the Bamiyan Buddha images. Why did you do it? Then he said, that is the will of the people. I said, you never had uh, consultation with the people before you destroyed the Bamiyan images. So I want to share with you that uh, these uh, Taliban men are living in a different age. So their ideology, their belief system is totally different. And I think that although the Western forces occupied Afghanistan for 20 years, they, were, they didn't invest adequately in developing Afghanistan. Their socioeconomic indices uh, improved marginally, but the focus was largely militarization. It is important to have a military presence. It is important to have an intelligence presence. But it is equally important for the socio-economic development to take place. In Sri Lanka, after the defeat of the LTT in mm -hmm. May 2009, Sri Lankan government had three phases. The humanitarian phase, where they rehabilitated the terrorists, reintegrated them, gave them amnesty, socio-economic development phase where Northeast grew at a much higher level than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. And of course, a political engagement phase where through elections, the TNA and other entities came to office. So such a political environment was not created in Afghanistan to improve the quality and the life of the Afghan people. Uh, is, is that because the United States uh, did not work hand in hand with the, uh, the, the government set up in Afghanistan? Or is it a problem you see in, in those who assumed uh, duty, uh, assumed power in Afghanistan? What went wrong here? US and Western forces poured in a lot of resources. 
But I only wish that if they put 90% for community engagement and development and economic activities and 10% for military operations and intelligence. So I think that they got the equation wrong. I think it is very important what they did because militarily they dismantled the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban infrastructure that trained 30 different terrorist groups in Afghanistan. So what they did was commendable. But from that point onwards, the model they, they had to recover Afghanistan from militancy to prosperity, that model didn't work. And part of the reason is the corruption of the Afghan regime that was installed. I met both uh, prime ministers, uh, Karzai. Okay. Uh, but, but my view is that they are good leaders, but they themselves couldn't get the machinery running. You know. They themselves could not adequately create that impact in Afghanistan, at the village, at the town, at the city level. So I think that both Karzai and Ghani did their best. As leaders, individual leaders, they were not corrupt. But certainly there was corruption on the ground and that will remain a constant problem. So I think that the way to overcome it is you should have a good education system, you should have also very tough laws where you will bring to justice people who are corrupt, people who break the rules. Um, Afghan people feel betrayed by their own leaders after the president fled the nation during the height of the takeover and the fall of uh, takeover by the Taliban group and the fall of the Afghan government. And, um, and, and there are others talking about the US betrayal uh, by the withdrawal of their forces suddenly without warning, leaving the Afghan, um, the troops, the government hanging. What is your observation of, of the US decision? And, and about uh, the, the, the authority. Having invested so much of treasure, so much of blood in Afghanistan, the Americans lacked what you call strategic patience. They should have ensured that there was a proper election. Certainly, Taliban could have participated in that election. And there were so many other actors that was in power in Kabul, and there was a smooth transition. But there was no patience on the part of uh, President Biden. So I believe that the Americans have made a mistake, a fatal mistake, by withdrawing such haste, where all their gains for 20 years was lost in that few months. There was no proper appreciation of the ground reality, no proper assessment of security and intelligence. Does this mean that uh, the destruction caused in Afghanistan f after uh, the, their pullout uh, is in the hands of the American leaders and, and also uh, the innocent, the fate of the innocent people, that, that the Americans are responsible for this? Americans lacked, the American politicians lacked leadership. American military, intelligence services, very capable forces. In fact, I would say that the American military is 20 years ahead of the Chinese and the Russian and the Indian and the other militaries because they have invested a lot in training, building their brain power and their fighting capacities. But ultimately, it is the political leadership that matters. Look at the last government. Okay. There was no proper political leadership the same intelligence community, the same military forces, same law enforcement officers were there. Easter attack happened. So it is ultimately the politicians and their leadership. So the Americans lacked good leaders who understood the security and intelligence, uh, the national security mm -hmm. dimensions. And that is why today in Iraq and Syria there is still fighting. Islamic State is still operating, and in the neighboring Afghanistan, Taliban has returned. Uh, I think it's time we take a short commercial break here at Hyde Park. We are in conversation with Professor Rohan Gunaratna, specialist in international security.
you're joining us at Hyde Park and we're discussing the return of the Taliban and the implications on Sri Lanka. Um, I think, Professor Gunaratna, you were talking about your discussion with uh, then Foreign Minister of the Taliban uh, group where you asked him about how and why they destroyed the Bamiyan Buddha statues. Now, you have been having engagements with them. The Taliban we see now seem to have completely revamped their strategy, or at least their approach with the international community, with the rest of the world to, sh to talk about how diplomatic they are, when uh, to talk about they will, um, they, will, they will vouch for the rights of the people, that they will protect women, that they will allow Afghan women to go to school. Now, this seems to be a different approach from the Taliban side. You've moved with them, you've spoken to them. How has this changed? Have they improved themselves over the past 20 years? Or is this a new strategic approach for recognition? After India joined the Quad, Pakistan was isolated. And we saw a geopolitical change in our region. And of course, we saw at that point Taliban becoming very active, formidable, returning. And today, the government of Qatar, the government in Pakistan, they have vouched for Taliban. So in many ways, Taliban's conduct will be somewhat influenced by those countries that have worked on the Doha Agreement and, of course, uh, Pakistan. So I believe it is important for the international community to watch Afghanistan very closely and see whether the Taliban can transform. But if you look at the development since August 15th, uh, 2021, more than 40 terrorist groups, they have praised the Taliban. They have congratulated the Taliban. They have pledged allegiance to the Taliban. So I believe that it is crucial for us to see where the Taliban is able to transform, meaning that there is there are elections in Afghanistan and that there is an inclusive government. Taliban itself cannot run Afghanistan because Taliban came to Kabul by force is unconstitutional, mm -hmm. there should be a mechanism to hold elections. So if Taliban moves away from what it was and is willing to work with other parties, mm -hmm. willing to respect women, willing to ensure that children go to school, willing to make sure that men and women both can work go to and serve in hospital, there are women doctors, mm -hmm. women announcers, and uh, TV producers. So I think, and there should be m women in parliament. So if they are going to have that seventh century Sharia law, I don't think any of that will happen. And if they are going to do amputations, beheadings, and stoning, I don't think the international community will recognize them. I don't think UN will give them a seat I don't think countries will want to have diplomatic and international relations with Afghanistan. So certainly those countries that have spoken on behalf of Taliban, they have to make sure that Taliban becomes an accepted actor in the international system. Uh, there are some apologies of the uh, Taliban group. Why has this, uh, what is this trend here? We have seen apologies for the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, the most brutal terrorist group in the world. And we have also seen apologies for the Taliban, which created the environment for the rise of Al-Qaeda and also provided the training for the nucleus of the Islamic State, Abu Musab al-Zakawi, that created the uh, the S Islamic State seed in Iraq was in Herat in Afghanistan. He trained in the al Matar camp and he moved out through Iran, through Mashhad, Tehran, to Kurmal in the north of Iraq, where Islamic State was created. 
But what we are seeing is that all these 30 to 40 groups were in Afghanistan. So the ideology of the Taliban, which is uh, the Obandi ideology, but deeply influenced by uh, the Salafi Wahhabi ideology, these ideologies are ideologies that are very detrimental to uh, Muslims, very detrimental to other countries because they are very exclusivist ideologies. Mm -hmm. And it is very important for the Muslim leaders not to uh, support terrorist and extremist organizations. Uh, let's talk a little about Sri Lanka here. Um, Easter Sunday attacks on, uh, in 2019, shortly after which I spoke to you, we spoke about your predictions of the movement's expansion to our part of the region and, uh, and the movement again. Uh, I'd like to talk about this uh, exclusivity and, and, and the kind of extremism that uh, these movements spread um, across the world. What is the threat to Sri Lanka now? The Sri Lankan Muslims uh, beautifully coexisted with the Buddhists, the Hindus and the Christians. But after 77, when we opened our economy, our ties with the Gulf countries enhanced. And that is the time we had these Gulf ideologies coming. So Sri Lankan Muslims that embraced the Sri Lankan culture, where they wore the sari, where they wore the sarong, they slowly started to embrace not only the Middle East and the Arab fashion, but also the Arab ideologies. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, strains of the ideology that came advocated al wala wal bara. That means loyalty to Muslims and hatred to non-Muslims uh, non or what is called unbelievers. Uh, they call it infidels or kufr. Not only that, these people who were influenced by these Gulf ideologies, they were against the very Muslims that have existed peacefully in this country for 1,400 years, the Sufi Muslims. So, for example, in Khatan Kodi, several hundred Sufi mosques were attacked, homes were attacked, their businesses were attacked. And Zaharan was one of them. In fact, before Zaharan went under underground in March, 2017, in the Aliyah Junction, he attacked the Sufis. In fact, it's called the sword cutting incident. And one year after that, the TID issued uh, open arrest warrant for Zahran. And Zahran became a wanted man. So this, the spread of these extremist ideologies from the Middle East should stop. And we cannot afford to have these ideologies taking root in this country because Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country. Of course, there are Hindus, Christians, and Muslims. But they can't go and attack the Buddha images in Mavanella. They can't attack the Mother Mary and the Ganesh images. Zaharan's group attacked not only Buddha images, although we haven't publicized it much. They also attacked Mother Mary and Ganesh statues. So attacking these idols is the idols, is the term used by them, which Taliban did in Afghanistan. They attacked the most beautiful standing Buddha images. Imagine someone attacked uh, the Kaaba in Mecca, how Muslims will feel. So Muslims should understand that this uh, business of attacking images should stop, that it, has, it, it is something more recent for years. Muslims lived in harmony and peace. I was in Samarkand and Bukhara mm -hmm. when the Bamiyan images were attacked. So in Samarkand and Bukhara, you can see, if you look at the history and the archaeology, there was always a Buddhist temple, Hindu temple, Sikh temple, Jewish temple, the Zoroastrians, the Manichis. So all communities lived in harmony. That is what we have to create in Sri Lanka, in the world. We can't have religious groups coming and saying, look, uh, these, uh, this is not uh, a good religion. Get rid of them. We can't do that. In, in, in Sri Lanka, we talk about certain groups advocating for Sharia law, implementation of Sharia law in Sri Lanka. Whereas in Afghanistan, there are women, men who are talking about their, how they fear 
the re-implementation of such law in Afghanistan. How does this ideology come to Sri Lanka? How do Sri Lankan Muslims, as you say, who have coexisted with our uh, entire population, diverse population for years, uh, embrace such ideology all of a sudden? A Muslim poet once said that Sri Lanka is the most beautiful place for people to live because everyone practice their religion without harming and hurting others. And I believe that the Sri Lankan Muslims should continue to live their life that way without asking for separation in everything, in education, in food, in banking, in clothing. So if they should live harmoniously and peacefully. It is very important for them to understand the sensitivities of the other communities. The other communities also should understand the sensitivities of the Muslims. So there must be constant consultation between the religious leaders. And I believe that they should be able to practice their religion, but without hatred towards other communities. Sharia law experience is a very bad one, historically. So in the name of Sharia law, terrible thing has been done. Stonings, amputations, beheadings. These cannot be implemented in our country. That is a seventh century uh, law in the Arabian Peninsula. The world has progressed so much. So I think that people should look at the future, not of those horrible things that happened in the past. Do you think Sri Lanka has made improvements or progress to ensure that we protect uh, our citizens from uh, uh, religious exclusivism, extremism and violence following our discussion in 2019 on the April 21st attacks, Easter Sunday attacks? You did mention about a series of steps that uh, government in Sri Lanka should implement policy decisions. Do you think we've made progress since then? Government has made some progress, but they must do much more. For example, uh, the O-level and the A-level textbooks uh, in Islamic studies in 2017 and 18, they had inserted the preachings of Ibn Abdul Wahab and his first disciple Ibn Qayyim. Um, this is Salafi Wahhabism. It is not uh, ideology suitable for our country. They had included Yusuf Kardavi, who advocated suicide attacks. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to reform the education system. We have to make sure that there are textbooks that do not advocate violence against other communities, that do not condemn other religions. We should. Uh, train a new generation of teachers that speak about commonalities in religion, the golden rule of all religions. Don't do to others what shouldn't happen to you. But the religious institutions, the DMRCA, the Department of Muslim Religious Cultural Affairs, their progress have been very slow. Similarly, the ACJU, the All Ceylon Jamiatul Ulema, they must issue a certificate for all clerics and certify that these clerics have also studied other religions so that they will not preach against other religions, they will not condemn other religions. Mm -hmm. And they must produce a generation, especially after Easter of Muslims, who love this country. Zahran didn't want people to stand for our national anthem. He didn't regard our presidents and prime ministers as his leaders. His leaders were Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in, in Syria and Iraq. So I think that the religious space and the educational space by the Ministry of Religious Affairs, Ministry of Education and the digital space, the Information Ministry has much more work to do. Today from Sri Lanka, anyone can access 20,000 extremist and terrorist websites. Mm -hmm. So they have to blacklist hate preachers from entering our country. They have to ensure that we do not distribute here terrorist and extremist content. And third is that they must ensure that we have preachers 
and we have madrasas and mosques that preach peace and harmony and not speak hatred towards other religions. This doesn't apply only to Muslims, it applies to Christians and Buddhists because there is radicalization and there is reciprocal radicalization. Mm -hmm. So religious leaders must conduct themselves appropriately. And we should consider a law like the, the Thai constitution. Monk cannot do politics. Monk has a place. A monk does politics in Thailand. Monk will be disrobed and will be sent to prison. So we must study the best practices of Buddhist countries and make sure that not only Buddhism, not only Islam, but also Buddhism is regulated and every monk will bring prestige to Buddhism. We have an illustration of um, Taliban links to, to terrorist groups. Um, I would like you to uh, explain to us, Professor Gunaratna, about uh, the Taliban, the links to terrorist groups, and the implications, as we promised to discuss, on Sri Lanka and the region. We're talking about regional security. We're talking about India here, Pakistan, just above India, and then our, our strategic uh, sea and, and, and the, the, the ocean. What is, what is the implication here to our part of the region? Two principal implications. One is from extremism and terrorism. Second is from transnational crime, primarily drugs. So today, most of the drugs that are entering our country, they are coming from uh, that region of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran. And I think that our Navy is doing a remarkable job. Our intelligence community is doing a remarkable job. But we have to strengthen our capacity to fight drugs. I would advocate that we move towards death penalty for those who do drug trafficking. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that this should be implemented as soon as possible. Second is on terrorism. As a country that has suffered for 30 years, and after a hiatus of 10 years, we again suffered a devastating attack. We should give nothing short of death penalty for terrorism. So I think that this government should consider, at least at this stage, especially after this tectonic development in Afghanistan of the Taliban remaining, and the Islamic State still active in Syria and Iraq, that we get our legal and policy framework right to manage these threats. Should Sri Lanka recognize the Taliban group? Taliban came to power unconstitutionally through the use of military force. Taliban did not come to power through an election. We are a democratic country and we should not recognize any regime that has not assumed power through military force. We should wait for there to be elections in Afghanistan, for an inclusive government to be formed in Afghanistan, for the UN to recognize that government in Afghanistan. And that is something that we should be very careful as a state because it will immediately send a wrong signal both to the people of the Northeast and to the Muslim community. So it is imperative, it is essential that we wait and see what is going to happen in Afghanistan before we go to recognize a uh, new actor in Afghanistan. Professor Rohan Gunaratna, thank you very much for your time here at Hyde Park. Um, you gave us an elaborate explanation and observation of the return of the Taliban since August 15th this year. But at the same time, you went, took us back 20 years ago uh, to the, uh, the, the, US, um, the US operations there, the launch of operations in search of bin Laden. And I thank you for all your observations, your expertise, and, 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 and uh, for sharing with us the extensive research understandings. Um, of yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Indy.
We had with us Professor Rohan Gunaratna, specialist in international security. And I must once again highlight the book written by Professor Gunaratna, Afghanistan after the Western drawdown, where he predicted the return of the Taliban group six years ago. Um, thank you very much for joining us at Hyde Park on Adha Derana 24.